Well, I'm uh, Fadi Diab, and I'm rector of St. Andrew's uh, Episcopal Church in Ramallah. Okay, all right. So that's in the West Bank. That's in the West Bank. Um, first of all, tell me how it is for you, for your, you know, your family, your your loved ones in the West Bank right now. Well, I I would say we're we're de devastated. Uh, uh, we're heartbroken. Uh, we're traumatized. We're shocked. Uh, uh, what is happening is really shocking on on all levels. Um, uh, things on the ground, the reaction of the world, uh, uh, the pictures we see on a you know hourly basis, the death toll that rises on a uh, uh, hourly basis. It's it's horrific. Sure, certainly. And, and are are you in an area that that's been I know that most of it is in Gaza, but West Bank is not immune either. I mean, ha have you seen this firsthand? Uh, well, we're we're in, we're not in the middle of Gaza, but we're in the middle of what is also happening in the West Bank. Just today, this morning, uh, at the outskirts of Ramallah, uh, there was an Israeli troops incursion uh, to one of the refugee camps, and uh, four people were killed and uh, many injured. So this is happening, like you know. Uh, in in our area, but our eyes also watch the news towards Gaza. Sure, sure. So certainly, and, and let's talk about Gaza. What are your ties to Gaza? Well, this is the same Palestinian community, whether you're in the West Bank or uh, Gaza. Um, uh, we have uh, relatives, we have families. Uh, I, I, like like when the when the Orthodox Church was was uh, uh, targeted and 18 people were killed uh, among the relatives were some people in my community um, so the ties with Gaza is is strong and this is uh, a, a, a Palestinian community whether the West Bank or Gaza and I understand that your church is also connected with the hospital system can you explain that? Yeah, we we have uh, we have uh, or the diocese runs um, uh, the Ahli Arab Hospital in Gaza, which is the oldest uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, one hundred thirty years, uh, and it's it's been really a wonderful ministry serving the community of Gaza, and uh, especially the needy, the marginalized uh, refugees who've been there for seventy five years. Uh, unfortunately, the hospital was uh, hit uh, some like seven, eight days ago, uh, leaving 471 casualties um, and uh, with damage also uh, in the hospital uh, building. And this is a hospital that you're well familiar with. Have you spent time there personally visiting it? So I am the I am the uh, vice chair of the hospital. I'm in in, in constant direct uh, uh, constant uh, 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 calls and uh, follow up with the hospital. Um, I've never been to Gaza. Uh, I've never been. I I need a permit to go to Gaza, and uh, there is no way that I can get a permit uh, to go to Gaza. Uh, recently, actually, uh, two weeks before the uh, war in Gaza, we were thinking of applying another time for a permit to go to Gaza. Uh, but the diocese, like Bishop, our bishop in the Diocese of Jerusalem, uh, goes to Gaza mostly um, uh, with international delegates who uh, are able to get permits. Mm -hmm. But I've never been to Gaza uh, all my life. But you are the the vice chair for the for the whole hospital for for the last for the last three uh, for the last two years. Oh, there's a lot of conversation about this hospital and what happened there. What what's the latest? Well, I I don't think we have we have the uh, the final. Uh, analysis of what happened because this is until now is disputed between the um, Israeli IDF and the uh, and the militant Palestinian militants on the ground. Um, there are some international agencies who also look into this and there have been some analysis. 
So I think both the uh, Israeli, Palestinian, and international, uh, there are still conflicting uh, versions of, of what, what happened concerning the hit. Uh, on the ground, uh, there were about 500 people uh, in the hospital uh, courtyard uh, and premises uh, who were um, who fled from the war or who whose whose uh, homes were attacked? They were taking refuge in the hospital. Uh, families with women and children. Uh, when the blast happened, uh, there were people also uh, working uh, as the medical staff and employees at the hospital. Uh, so uh, the the uh, the high number of uh, deaths occurred because the hospitals opened its door to people fleeing from the war. Sure. Is some of that hospital still operating? Well, according to the uh, uh, releases from the Palestinian Health uh, Ministry, uh, that I think eight uh, is uh, eight hospitals are out of uh, duty uh, because of the either the lack of electricity or because of the uh, shelling. Uh, there, there are a couple of hospitals uh, are still functioning. Our hospital went back to work uh, yesterday uh, with the minimal, uh, uh, minimal staff because the uh, um, emergency uh, and the operation, one of the operation theaters were struck by the by the blast. So uh, there we have only one operation theater, and uh, they're doing some repair at the emergency room. I mean, if there's anything that should be off limits, it's a hospital. There is no excuse, Vic. There is no excuse. What is what is happening in Gaza is is a brutal uh, attack on civilians uh, on. Uh, healthcare institutions, uh, on human rights organizations, on the UN, like the, the uh, UN General Secretary yesterday said 35 uh, deaths among the uh, UN uh, workers. Uh, so UN schools, UN facilities, school, uh, schools, hospitals, this, there's no excuse. What is the remedy here? I know that's a hard question. Well, well, I, I think my own, my own uh, analysis of this is this is the failure of the international community to solve this conflict for a long time. This is the uh, the frustration of the Palestinian people under occupation for uh, seventy five five years. Uh, this is the Israeli denial of Palestinian rights uh, and. Palestinian uh, freedom and independence and self-determination. Uh, this is all together. This is this is also uh, engagement of the uh, regional and international, uh, you know, countries for particular reasons in the region. Um, so th th there are multiple of reasons, but I think the, the number one, I would blame the international community. There have been, there, there are uh, uh, UN resolutions unimplemented for like 60 years. Uh, so I think I, I, I personally would, would blame the international community. And I think uh, countries like the US, uh, the UK, Europe, those countries who have the power to implement things on the ground, like the U the the uh, uh, Security Council had several resolutions on the conflict. No one was pushed uh, forward. How do you feel about the U.S. and other allies backing Israel, sending resources to help Israel when? There are people on all sides dying and suffering because of this conflict. Well, you know, Vic, one of one of the really uh, painful uh, uh, feeling about this conflict is 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 to feel abandoned, to feel like the international community is relegating you to the state of nothingness, 
I think this state, this the this feeling of being left alone, uh, I think is the worst among all. Um, I, I I would assure you, like what I'm here, what I'm hearing from the community and on the social media is that the Palestinian people and also the Arab community, uh, they lost trust in the international community. They lost. Um, anything that has to do with the West. Uh, the, the, the international community talk about democracy, human rights, children rights, women rights, elderly rights. So, you know, all, all of this rhetoric about freedom and justice and democracy is all but uh, empty rhetoric. I mean, for us, in the last 18 years, what we saw is that the Palestinian people as a, uh, the community is like, you know, uh, an unimportant community. We don't know them. We talk about them as numbers. Uh, they're like, you know, tiles of death. Uh, and again, you feel as your life doesn't matter. Your life is is nothing compared to others. Like when when the attack uh, on October seven seven uh, occurred, you know the the international community showed great and important anger because that they've got the right to be angry about you know attacking civilians, any civilian. But when the Palestinian civilian children are being targeted. You know, as of today, we have about 2,100 children. Children. I mean, can we believe in the human rights anymore? The Western human rights, the Western democracy. So I think I think what we're what we're facing at this point, and, and yesterday I was listening to an interview on CNN with Queen Rania of Jordan, and she said this the same like we we lost um faith with the western standards uh we lost uh faith in the western uh, values can you differentiate the people of palestine versus those who are affiliated with hamas well this is Hamas is a Palestinian uh, organization or uh, movement. So Hamas is not like some other community uh, among the Palestinian people. And and I, I, I don't know if you know, uh, if you remember in 2006, Hamas won the Palestinian election. It was, it was uh, the majority party in the Palestinian Legislative Council. So when we talk about Hamas, I feel some people think that this is these are like aliens coming among the Palestinians. No, no, that's that's not the case. Hamas is a is a movement, a Palestinian uh, liberation movement, according to the Palestinian version. According to the Israeli version and the inter and some international kinds, it's a terrorist group because it uh, attacks uh, Israel. So, I mean. Western uh, media try to convince the Palestinians that Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinians. I know Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinians because until now we have a, the Palestinian Authority that represents the Palestinian. But Hamas is a is a movement. It's not a militant. It's not only a militant group. It's a movement among the Palestinian people. Like in areas uh, like the West Bank, they're, they're Hamas. Uh, Hamas won, uh, if I'm not wrong, Hamas won the student body at Birzeit University last year uh, election. So I, th I think uh, Hamas is not only in, 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 in Gaza, uh, but again, Hamas is also supported by regional powers like Iran. And this is actually part of this because of the conflict between Israel and Iran and the West and Iran. And because Hamas is one of the branches that uh, is affiliated with Iran. So Hamas is 
considered also supported by a foreign country like Iran rather than the Palestinian community. But a, so, lot, of people, uh, a lot of people in the world are saying there is no excuse, no matter what the history is, for Hamas fighters to, to go and kill families, kill people at a music festival. Of course. Of course, there is no excuse of any, any violence against civilians, point. So, I mean, I think there is no excuse for Hamas militants to go into Israel and attack people. There's no excuse for the Israeli army to bomb civilians. There's no excuse for U.S. to bomb a city somewhere or a village somewhere. There's no excuse for Russia to bomb, you know, Ukrainian civilians. And there is no excuse for attacking any civilian. But again, the argument is, if we consider Hamas as a terrorist organization by attacking civilians, would that argument applies for the Israeli army? This is an important question for many people around the world today because the glaring double standard of dealing with things is generating more anger and more hatred and, and by the way increasing aggravating religious fanaticism and fundamentalism so we're not helping here fight radicalism we're even we're even pushing these radicals even more to radicalism because we're we're letting them know that okay uh, you're killed, the killer is not terrorist. If you kill someone, you're a terrorist. So what that leaves inside of many people is that this is unfair, this is unjust, and because it is uh, unjust, then the only thing I think of is radicalism. Because part of radicalism is that you feel unjust, you, you feel treated unjustly. As a man of God, in such challenging times, what do you tell your congregation? Well, these are very difficult times, Vic. I think, I think, um, as as leader, religious leaders in the community, we also face uh, impasses uh, when we talk to people, uh, when we when we answer their questions. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to someone who is planning to immigrate to Scotland for work. And um, at the end, I said, may God be with you. And, and the, the woman said, uh, is there still a God after what we have seen? Such, such questions and such conclusions are really, really difficult to deal with in the Palestinian uh, context. On social media, I keep uh, seeing more and more posts from the Psalms uh, when the psalmist says, God, where are you in the midst of death? God, I am weak and I have no power. You know, all these verses from the Bible that uh, people of old uh, also uh, questioned God. Um, so people are looking at what is happening and it's beyond our rational, you know, uh, analysis. Um, and they're questioning God because it's difficult. So what we're trying to do at, at this point is try to help people see God even in the suffering, God even with the victims, God being uh, close to those shelled and bombed in Gaza, God taking care with the injured and wounded. So uh, I think the main thing, we, we the, the, the basic uh, message is for the people to keep hope, not to lose its faith, uh, not to uh, opt for violence or radicalism, um, to pray, to uh, reach out for those in need in the community, and to be strong uh, as, as one community. And this has not been easy for us religious leaders because, you know, we as religious readers are broken. Uh, and and actually, this is this is like you know, uh, uh, I would say even a positive way because as 
broken leaders, we uh, can reach out to broken hearts uh, more authentically. But it is it is really difficult. A lot of us, let's say in the United States, feel helpless because we see this pain, we see this suffering, we see the destruction, and we want to help, but we don't know how. What can we do? Well, I think um, I do believe that we can do a lot, even with small small um, uh, acts uh, of telling truth, uh, of questioning the um, uh, general narrative, of reaching to the uh, other narrative uh, by reaching out. You know, th what you're doing here today is you're trying to help. And I hope the, the, the Western media would listen more to the voices on the ground. I think these voices matter for what is true uh, and what is genuine, uh, rather than uh, you know, listening to some people or politicians or you know, analysis who read the news and analyze you know, here and there. And I think uh, what I've been seeing and hearing from many others is that the Western media is um, focusing on the Israeli narrative uh, without any interest of listening to another voice. And I think that is wrong. That is wrong. We have always insisted on listening to the grassroots. If you want to know what is happening, you need to listen to the grassroots. You need to listen to the people on the ground. Unless you put your boots on the ground, unless you uh, live that experience of pain, I think it is difficult for people to understand what it, what it means to be in this context. And again, Israeli people were hurt and uh, they, continue to mourn the death of their loved ones. And Palestinian uh, people uh, were, you know, devastated and they continue to mourn their loved ones. How can we reach to both of them rather than reaching to one of them? Sure. I want to go back to the hospital real quickly and then I'll let you go. But, uh, uh, you know, there's reports that the hospitals are, are running out of fuel running out of electricity they're running out of supplies for the hospital that you manage what's the future how do they continue to treat the growing number of casualties well i i called the uh director the uh, of the hospital um uh, yesterday and uh, was checking with her on fuel and she said we have fuel for like four or five days and I know that there have been some attempts to uh, bring some fuel into the Gaza Strip for mainly for the hospitals. Until now, I think uh, the uh, attempts uh, didn't succeed. Uh, I read in the news today that uh, Israel is not allowing more fuel to Gaza. Uh, and even uh, when the United Nations uh, required fuel for its facilities, Israel even refused to. Um, but you know, Vic, um, you don't need fuel. If you're cutting electricity, water, food, any supply that sustains life, you don't even need 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 fuel because you're 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 putting people into a death sentence slowly. I have I have received news today that people don't have water to drink. They drink seawater. Today, like today, I've received news. They, they don't have water to drink. If you cut water on the whole Palestinian community living in the Gaza Strip, that is a genocide. How can how can anyone cut water on, on a whole community? devastating them to the state of death if you're cutting water and this is like this is not my my assumptions these are 
uh, Israeli uh, officials announced that at the beginning of the war, cutting water, fuel, electricity, food from getting to Gaza. And you know what? They're allowing 20 uh, trucks every day for 2 million people. This is insane. This is inhumane. I mean, I think I, I can't imagine talking about it. And we're we're like in the 21st century. So our hospital, I mean, I I think it will uh, function for the coming uh, four five days maximum if they have uh, fuel. But at a point, they'll stop. Yeah. So. Would you support a ceasefire? Is that is that what of course. needed here? Ceasefire I mean, I, and the blockade. I at this point, I think the only thing that we should call for is for a ceasefire. We want to save lives. I think the most important thing in this is to save lives. On both sides, it is very important, and and unfortunately, the U.S. has not been supporting that. And that is that is a shame for um, uh, many people in the U in the United States who would see the death toll rising by the hour and not call for a ceasefire. The, I think we don't want to talk about anything else now. We want to save lives. The only thing the only thing we care about at this point is how to save lives. You know, they're they're about. Uh, 200 people still under rebels in Gaza. They can't reach out to them. There, there, there are more than 200 bodies under the rebels of the building's head, and they can't reach, to, uh, reach out to them. Can we save lives? This is the most basic, basic question we need to ask ourselves and the international community. Can we save lives? Anything else, sir? Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, Thank you. The, the interview. And uh, please, uh, I mean, if I've been emotional, please understand this is part of the frustration, part of the pain that we carry in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies uh, on, on constantly during these three weeks. Uh, but I, through your channel, I urge the U.S. administration, and I urge the international community to call for a ceasefire, immediate ceasefire, just for, for, for saving lives, just for saving lives. Do you think there's an end in sight? Sorry, couldn't hear you. Is there an end in sight? I think from the past experiences uh, in this region or many other regions, uh, there is no, there is the war, war wouldn't achieve our goals. Warning doesn't achieve our, our, our uh, goals. At the end, there will come a time when both parties will sit down and negotiate and the third party intervenes. Why, why keep losing lives and at the end, we know that we, we want to sit together and talk. Well, thank you uh, for for your words. And um, you know, I think it's very powerful. I'll probably post this interview raw in addition to, you know, which we're able to use on, on air.